Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today is Monday, October 19th. We have reached the 15 day mark now until the elections on November 3rd. There's so much to break down. Uh, very exciting time. Uh, as you know, uh, tomorrow is the two week mark. Um, so this is sort of going to be a lumped in two week and 15 day mark video in one. Uh, no sense in making two of them as there's not going to be enough developments between now and then. But, but again, I will uh, make another sh shameless plug for you here. As I said on my last uh, presidential and Senate election video, um, starting at the 10-day mark, we will have a new projection out for you in both the presidential and Senate races every single day up until Election Day itself. So be, be sure to stay tuned for that. Um, this is obviously such an exciting time. Uh, but we're going to get right into it as we have some new developments to break down. And as we always do, we're going to go west to east. Now, I did receive one comment um, on my last video uh, asking why I do not go safe to likely to lean to tilt as most of the other channels do. Well, the reason I like to do it this way and go west to east is because if you do it the original way, sometimes um, you get this urge to just kind of move on with it and then eventually break it down. Whereas this time, if we do it this way, you can actually get a sense of how the election unfolds. And you get a sense of all 50 states as opposed to kind of lumping them into these groups as we so often do. This election at the end of the day is a 50 race election, even though a lot of people like to um, break it down into eight or 10 states. The reality of the situation is all 50 states are voting. Okay, so this way you get a sense of just how the election unfolds from start to finish. Now, I know it you know, is cold from east to west, but we go west to east because I'm also taking into account what a certain commenter recommended, which is to get to those important states later. And a lot of them happen to be on the east coast and in the Midwest. So starting in Hawaii, um, that's a safe state. We know that. Whereas in Alaska, um, the Trump campaign, I don't think needs to be too concerned about this state on the presidential level if they need to be concerned at all. Um, whereas uh, Dan Sullivan, the incumbent GOP senator, uh, to me is actually in a real race um, against Dr. Al Gross. Um, his in Dan Sullivan's incumbency um, has been uh, a steady talking point um, throughout the election. Um, he had a little bit of a gaffe when he posted a video of himself or a picture of himself with, this is some time ago now, with Elijah Cummings when trying to make a tribute video uh, uh, supporting him and the late John Lewis. Of course, Marco Rubio did the same thing. Now, polling has been spotty um, in this state. Um, we haven't seen uh, a whole lot um, carrying over from the Dan Sullivan gaffe that would suggest that's impacting voters in the state at all. And on the presidential level, I'm going to label it safe, more from a likelihood characterization um, than a margin characterization. In Washington, that's going to be a safe state. And we've seen how every how the protests up there have affected that state. It didn't really need to be, you know, pushed any further into the Democratic column than it already is. So there's really nothing to be too concerned about if you're the Democratic Party in that state uh, in particular. In Oregon, another safe state. Um, and then in California, as if it wasn't safe enough to begin with, Kamala Harris is going to push this one uh, even further uh, over the top for the party. Now, in the state of Nevada, we've talked before how I think the Democratic Party should be a little bit concerned about this state. Why is that? Well, um, in 2018, uh, they had a very, very good night in the midterms here. They were able to flip um, the seat, Senate seat held by Dean Heller for a long time. Jackie Rosen ousted him, and that was a big uh, pickup for the Democratic Party. They were also able to flip the governorship from red to blue when Steve Sisolak uh, assumed power um, for the Democrats there. Um, however, um, as you can tell, obviously any state that only has six electoral votes, you know, is not going to be an absolute wipeout for the Democratic Party unless it's on the East Coast, like Delaware or Rhode Island or states like that. Um, and so in Nevada, um, a big portion of the Democratic Party's success over the years in this state, dating back to the days of Harry Reid and beyond, um, has been um, because they have generated a very, very successful turnout apparatus that has boosted Democratic candidates up and down the ballot uh, for a long time. So there is a little, it's always a little hard to know exactly what the voting calculation is in this state because not only is the turnout operation very good for the Democrats, but at the same time, the Republican Party is almost always overstated in polling in this state. And so those two things at work would generally um, suggest that the Democrats are all together um, in position to win this state and never look back. 
But of course, there's a raging pandemic going on where 8 million people worldwide have uh, contracted uh, COVID-19 and over 200,000 people have succumbed to it here in the United States. And so a massive turnout operative um, is not going to be as effective this time. And the Democratic Party does not have too much of, an, of a margin for error in this state. Democrats typically don't win here by double digits. Um, will they win by eight points, six points? Probably. But I will say this. I do think even if there's a low turnout, um, surprisingly low turnout in the state, I think at the end of the day, um, the Democratic Party can still expect to be OK, um, considering um, this is a Democratic wave here with a deeply unpo unpo excuse me, deeply unpopular incumbent, as we know. And as a result, I expect Joe Biden to survive in this state. I'm going to label it likely Idaho is a safe Republican state. Now, in Montana, um, the reality of the situation is here. It's much more competitive on the other statewide races, the Senate race, the governor race, the House race, whereas the presidential race in this state is not very competitive. Now, um, I do think Joe Go Biden... Go rescue the economy. Oh, excuse me. Uh, I do expect Joe Biden uh, to outperform um, some of those margins in this state, um, and that being, uh, you know, around 42, 43 percent. Remember Barack Obama, who you just briefly heard from, I accidentally hit a button, I apologize, on my computer. Um, he and Joe Biden in 2008 got 46 percent of the vote up here in this state. OK, so, you know, there's obviously we know the, the, we know the whole calculus. There are a lot of ca wealthy California types that own second homes up in Montana. A lot of environmentalists up here. It's a largely a pro-choice state. Um, so all that in mind, I still think, you know, this is going to be more of a margin characterization. I'm going to label it likely. Wyoming will be safe. Now, in Utah, the final margin here is going to be very interesting to watch for a number of reasons. Number one, again, very unpopular incumbent. That's the first thing. Second thing, Mitt Romney, of course, is a very beloved figure in the state of Utah. He has not endorsed Donald Trump. He has been a frequent critic of his. He voted to convict Donald Trump in the impeachment proceedings. Also, Evan McMullen, who got more than one out of every five votes in the 2016 election in this state, endorsed Joe Biden. OK, so you have two very, very well-known political figures, both nationally and in this state, that have either not supported Donald Trump and have been explicit about that, or have also explicitly stated that they are not only not supporting Donald Trump, but will support Joe Biden. So the final margin will be interesting here, but obviously, will it go blue? Not a chance. Um, in the state of Arizona, um, this has been a realignment possibility for the Democrats for a little bit now, but really, this is the first chance they really get at it. Now, in 2018, it was a little bit surprising, I would say, when uh, Martha McSally um, lost to Kirsten Sinema. Um, it wasn't um, terribly surprising, but I would say it was relatively unexpected. Um, Kirsten Sinema, a pretty moderate Democratic senator, all things considered. At the same time, though, she is an openly bisexual woman. So how moderate is that demographically, at least? Um, Maricopa County in Phoenix is the largest growing municipal area in the United States. As we know, more and more people from the Rust Belt and the northern portion of the United States continue to move southward into Arizona, Georgia, um, Texas, places like that. So in Arizona... Um, that obviously, that demographic shift is going to help the, de um, the Democrats um, quite a bit. And we obviously know for years, people from California have moved into this state. And that's been a consistent theme um, for the Democratic Party for a long time in this area of the country. It's helped them in Nevada and Oregon, etc. Now, in 2020, there's also another big Senate race going on. And the Democrats have a shoe in at this point to that seat. It's Mark Kelly this time, who is the former veteran, the former astronaut, the husband of Gabrielle Giffords. Um, who is coincidentally also running against Martha McSally. If you ask me, I think it was political suicide by Doug Ducey, the uh, GOP governor of the state of Arizona, who just reappointed her to that open seat, knowing damn well that she was at best gonna, gonna suffer through a very tough reelection bid because the Democrats have been pointing to the state for a long time, let alone you know the fact that Martha McSally is deeply disliked in the state and Mark Kelly has long been, and he and his family have long been revered and further complicating things for Martha McSally. Um, just yesterday, in fact, uh, that story surfaced where she and her campaign in an ad uh, mistakenly used a photo of Mark Kelly's twin brother uh, instead of Mark Kelly himself. So nothing is going right for her campaign. She's down double digits. She's been woefully outraised. Um, she is in all likelihood going to lose that Senate race. And I think that is going to carry up to the top of the ballot. And as a result, I expect Joe Biden to carry the state of Arizona and its 11 electoral votes. I'm going to label this lean. 
Now, in New Mexico, it's an open state um, or open seat on the Senate level, but that's not really anything to consider. It's not, in my opinion, really a swing state anymore. You can't call it a safe Democratic state just because of its history and its low electoral votes, et cetera, and the final margins. And, of course, it was only up until 2018 when there was, after all, a Republican governor. Gary Johnson was involved in the state for a long time, so you get the idea. Um, in Colorado, it's very similar to New Mexico. Of course, Cory Gardner is sort of the last vestige of GOP politics in this state. But any time, as we've broken down in this, um, on this channel, when you are able to replace um, an outgoing governor who's typically going on to other things in this exact circumstance that John Hickenlooper did, where he relinquished his um, office as governor to ultimately run for president, and they the voters in Colorado swiftly replaced him with Jared Polis, who is, if anything, pretty far to the left of John Hickenlooper. Hickenlooper has been known to be much of a centrist, whereas Jared Polis has much more progressive policies and, of course, is the first openly gay governor of the, in, um, in the United States. So I'm also going to label this safe, and it's nine votes for Joe Biden. North Dakota will be safe for the Republicans. South Dakota has been a state that the Democrats have usually thought of as a state they can be competitive in and be respectable in. Of course, Tim Johnson wasn't, so, you know, but ultimately on the, you know, in this climate, it's not a state you can really expect to be too competitive and neither will Nebraska be any competitive. Kansas on the Senate level is worth watching, but on the presidential level, it's going to be safe. I do think this is a state that voters should keep an eye on um, in the not, for the not so distant future, because it's kind of interesting, you know, what may be beginning to unfold in this state little by little. Um, so just keep an eye on that. Oklahoma is one of two states, the other being West Virginia, where Donald Trump won every single county in 2016. No, no sign of that changing whatsoever. Now, in Texas, this is one we definitely have to break down. Um, this is basically a swing state now, which is a remarkable statement. And that reality alone has pushed the current GOP platform and the current GOP as it is made up at the moment um, to the brink of extinction. Now, do I mean that the Republican Party is gone forever or on the brink of it? No. What I mean is that the way it's currently constructed, the fact that the state of Texas, you know, which has basically been the Republican Party's California for years and years now, the fact that that is even remotely up for grabs is telling. And the fact that Joe Biden may actually win the state is even more telling. So let's break down why. Well, for a long time, you know, for 15 years, it's been a state that even though it's, you know, reliable for the GOP, at the end of the day, a Democrat can get a respectable amount of votes. Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, they were able to get, you know, into the mid 40s. And even Lupe Valdez, who was not a very well liked candidate for the Democratic, uh, she was a de Democratic candidate for governor back in 2018. Even she got around 43%. Um, there are tons and to hundreds of thousands of new voters that are being registered every year. Um, we heard Beto O'Rourke um, on a recent appearance say that um, there's somewhere between 800 and 900,000 new registered voters in the state of Texas just in the last two years. Okay, that's an extremely high amount. Um, the Democratic Party, believe it or not, actually has a chance to flip. It's a slightly outside chance, but they have a chance to flip the out to flip the state house in the state of Texas. That would be that was that was unheard of even five years ago. Okay, but the first sign of a potential breakthrough was not only that the presidential candidates were getting respectable vote margins, but that Beto O'Rourke. Um, was able to get over 43% of the vote, 48.3 to be exact, against Ted Cruz back in 2018. Now, there are two ways to look at this, right? This is, you know, kind of there are two sides of this coin. Um, the positive for the Democrats being that, you know, they found a candidate who was able to rile up an extreme amount of energy, et cetera, et cetera, and get close, 48.3%. That's a sign of progress. However, um, the positive sign for the GOP is, well, look, basically everything lined up for the Democrats in that election. And they couldn't pull it out, right? They had an extremely unpopular um, incumbent um, senator in Ted Cruz. He was being challenged by a very well-liked uh, member of the House who generated a ton of enthusiasm, who visited all 254 counties in the state of Texas, who raised a ridiculous amount of money, who was relatively moderate, the, the whole deal. And they still lost. So there's kind of two ways to examine this. And there's sort of two ways to really dissect what may be happening with the voters here. But the, the reality of the situation is the amount of new registrants is very telling. The other telling aspect of this state is that, keep in mind, Donald Trump led on election day in the state of Texas by 12%. He won it by 9%. Okay, so a little bit of a shift there. 
Um, turnout was a little higher than people um, in the state of Texas and it was in some other states because turnout was very low in 2016. Um, and in 2018, not only for Beto O'Rourke was it high, but it was also high for Colin Allred, who flipped a big house win for the Democrats right up here in North Dallas. A uh, little plug that actually happens to be my home uh, district, even though, as I mentioned, I'm in the state of Florida. That's officially my home state now. I was born and raised in North Dallas. And so Colin Allred happens to be my new congressman. Um, and so that that was a, a, an area where the Democratic Party was very, very focused, um, was um college educated voters um, sort of up in the Plano area, if I have any Dallas sites who are familiar with that. Um, and that's where the majority of new registrants are being seen in um, the DFW Metroplex, also down here in Harris County in South, um, South Texas, Southeast Texas. Um, now, the reason you just saw me uh, label it tilt was because even though Donald Trump only leads by 1.4%, and we saw that three-point shift um, the other um, that I just mentioned from 2016, the reality of the situation is we are seeing active voter suppression efforts on the part of the governor there, Greg Abbott. Those are not my words. Those are the words of a federal judge there who happens to be a GOP president appointee, okay? Um, we saw Greg Abbott. They announced that they're only allowing one drop-off site per county. Okay, there are counties in Texas kind of over here in the western portion of the state where there are less than a thousand people. In Harris County, I believe there are over four million people um, alone, you know, in Houston and the, and the surrounding areas of Woodlands, Conroe, et cetera. Um, so that, that, I mean, that's just active voter suppression. There's no other way around it. There's no other way to say it. It's a fact. It's indisputable. And so that's going to help the Republicans. Now, the amount of new registrants is very, very exciting for the Democratic Party. In the Senate race there between now MJ Hager and John Cornyn, a lot less money being poured into it, even though the Democratic Party has maintained they think MJ Hager has a real chance. I think they're a little bit wrong about that. Um, but, um, you know, she does have somewhat of a chance. I, I just don't think it's a very good one. Um, furthermore, uh, what we've seen is the Republican Party has been able to successfully um, limit, as we said, the amount of drop-off sites and also limit the amount of um, television um, advertisements that we've seen from both parties because they successfully, they, they kind of identified this problem um, real early on in the campaign season. And so beginning in February and March, there were a lot of ads supporting Donald Trump that weren't even necessarily like, because yeah, uh, did we even know the nominee by that? We may have. Uh, my calendar is a little off. Um, but it was more just like supporting Donald Trump in general, um, targeting his approval rating. So they may have gotten out a little bit of, ahead of this. I expect Joe Biden to eclipse 48%, get right around where Beto O'Rourke got, but he'll come up just short. All right. Now, in the state of Minnesota, the Republicans thought they had a chance at this state at, um, after what happened in 2016 when Hillary Clinton won with only a plurality of the vote. And it only w ended up being 1.5%. Um, so logically, they sort of identified that state as a potential growth opportunity. But again, low approval ratings and what happened in 2018 kind of put any doubts about that to rest when the Democrats swept three for three in the midterm races. Tina Smith and Amy Klobuchar both won um, their Senate races. The Tina Smith one particularly notable as the Republicans thought that because that was the seat being vacated by Al Franken, who resigned in a lot of controversy, that maybe they had a chance there. Well, Tina Smith ended up winning. She's in uh, another re-election campaign now to serve her first full six-year term in the Senate. She's probably going to be just fine. And of course, also won the governorship or when Tim Walls easily won um, the governorship there. And then, of course, everything happening with George Floyd in that whole situation in Minneapolis has only boosted um, enthusiasm and turnout for the Democrats. I'm going to label this safe. Now, in Iowa, a very interesting state to break down. Um, it's kind of a split decision state. It's a very elastic state by and large. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, um, the governor and both senators are Republican. So that would pretty much suggest to you um, that it's a Republican state, right? Well, uh, there are four House seats in the state of Iowa. Um, three of them are controlled by Democrats. Um, the one that they don't is up here in the northwest portion of the state that was for years controlled by Steve King. Um, so clearly, um, you know, there's a good presence that the Democratic Party is able to have. And there is a hyper competitive um, Senate race here going on between um, incumbent Joni Ernst and Teresa Greenfield, her Democratic challenger. As of now, T Teresa Greenfield is leading um, Joni Ernst, and that's a pretty significant development, um, considering Joni Ernst was for a long time sort of considered one of the rising stars of the party um, as of her election six years ago with that infamous Let's Make Him Squeal ad. 
Um, so let's go through some of the recent polling. Most of it was, has been done by SurveyMonkey, which is not a very reputable, reputable pollster, but it's really the old, the recent data that we have. So let's break it down. Biden plus three, and then a tie. Biden plus one, Trump plus two, Biden plus one, Trump plus two, Biden plus one, Trump plus one, tie, Trump by two, Trump by one. Um, and that's the last presidential poll until the, about two weeks ago. So clearly it's a dead heat, okay? Now, I do think that Teresa Greenfield is boosting Joe Biden's chances here. Joe Biden has not focused on this state too much um, since the primary, and I think that's going to be his undoing. But again, in a Democratic wave year, also combined with the fact that we saw um, better numbers for the Democrats in 2018 when Fred Hubble, the Democrat, came much closer to defeating Kim Reynolds in the gubernatorial race uh, than Hillary Clinton was able to um against Donald Trump. So I think this is, I'm still going to label this tilt. I know some have been urging me to finally change this characterization as it's been pretty much this way throughout the whole season, but I just can't see it happening as of yet. There's still 15 days, but you know, as of now, I can't see it going that way. In Missouri, this used to be a little bit swingy. Um, remember Barack Obama came up only 4,000 votes short here, um, but it's consistently shifted to the right. And after, and 10 years later, in 2018, Claire McCaskill was defeated by Josh Hawley, who is a very, very supportive member of the Senate for Donald Trump. Um, this is going to be a margin characterization. I'm going to label it likely. Arkansas will be safe, as will Louisiana. Now, in the state of Mississippi, this will be a lot of high turnout in this state, the highest minority population state in the United States. Mike Espy, the Democratic challenger for the Senate, is giving it another shot um, against Cindy Hyde-Smith after he came up short in the special election uh, a few years ago. Um, but of course, even then, when he lost 54 to 46, um, even then, Cindy Hyde-Smith's whole campaign was embroiled in controversy after some racially insensitive comments were made by her. Um, so that gives you a sense of where the state lands. We don't have much polling at all in this state, but I'm going to label it um, likely more as a margin characterization, whereas Alabama will be safe. Now, we did get one poll in Alabama just the other day that actually had Doug Jones leading Tommy Tuberville by one point, if you can believe that. Um, but to me, that's just a one-off. And when you're winning your one-off polls by 1%, um, that's generally a telltale sign. Okay, in Florida. Uh, there's been a lot of mixed signals in this state uh, over the last four years. Um, most of them, I think, have favored the Republicans. Okay, Donald Trump um, somewhat surprisingly won this state back in 2016. Um, it, it, yeah, it was moderately surprising, um, as, as even though he did lead in the state of Florida by 1% on election day. It was just because throughout election night, a lot of the um, urban areas have been counted first, and what ultimately ended up being a very slim margin, Donald Trump carried it by about 100,000 votes. In 2018, the Republicans did very well here in the midterms. Bill Nelson, um, with the longtime Democratic incumbent senator, lost okay, to Rick Scott. And then they also held on to the governorship there when Ron DeSantis defeated Andrew Gillum in a very, very close race. Um, the Democrats did have some good stuff happen in the House. They flipped a couple seats down here in the South Florida area, although those Democratic incumbents are very unpopular at the moment. And in some of the local races, I can just tell you as I'm here in Miami, um, the Republicans look good for some of the local um, seats down here, not just the Miami-Dade County uh, mayorship, but um, some of the state house uh, races. Uh, they, they are in the clear there at the moment. But um, Joe Biden has consistently led Donald Trump in polling in this state. OK, now that is not really a good sign, though, in most senses for Joe Biden. Obviously, he's you know happy to be leading. But at the end of the day, we've seen this before when Democrats lead in the polls here and ultimately come up short. And in fact, the Republicans have narrowed, the Democrats in this state generally have a very large registration advantage. It's usually hundreds and hundreds of thousands. The Republicans have narrowed it to less than 140,000. Okay, and there's still two weeks for them to get people registered. Early voting started today in the state of Florida. Let's go through the most recent polling. Uh, tie, Biden plus two, tie plus two, plus two, plus three, tie plus one, plus three, plus three. OK, so that's not enough for Joe Biden right now. Now, it is a Democratic wave year, as we know, and that is important. And the reality of the situation is, yes, Joe Biden is actually leading in the polls here still. OK, we can't just blindly follow the polls, but we also can't ignore them either. Okay, They're the best data that we have, and sometimes they're just fractionally wrong. Um, and remember, let's not forget either that even though there's been all this whining and griping about how quote unquote wrong the polls were in 2016, even though they really weren't, um, in fact, they were a little bit wronger in 2018, 
all these pollsters have reworked their methodology, okay, to accommodate some of the errors that they felt they made. They do this every two years um, to get a little bit more accurate. And then generally, they always become a little more accurate. Only this time, between 16 and 18, they were more accurate in 16 than they were in 2018. So right now, I think because of the reworked methodology, because of the amount of money the Biden campaign has poured into the state, and because of the fact that, look, Joe Biden is, after all, 2 and o, uh, in the state of Florida, I have him winning this state. Um, by a tilt margin. Okay, in the state of Georgia, um, another state the Democratic Party is extremely bullish on. There are two Senate seats here that are very competitive that will break down in our Senate election prediction video coming up soon. Um, so it's very, very compelling to watch this state and see where it ends up on both levels. Um, Look, the reality of the situation is kind of like Texas. This is another state that we've seen a lot of active voter suppression in. That governor race two years ago was embroiled in controversy between Brian Kemp and Stacey Abrams. Brian Kemp is up again in two years, and the Democratic Party has been very active, um, already beginning to consolidate some of their efforts to try to oust him. They have some good potential candidates there, Keisha Lance Bottom, Stacey Abrams again, who knows. Um, Look, again, high turnout in this state is going to be absolutely crucial. Um, and the reality of the situation is um, we've seen all these stories about how many new registered voters there have been. And there, the thing is, you can just see the electoral votes. Texas has 38. Georgia has 16. That's over two times more. There are only 50,000 less new registered voters in the state of Georgia from two years ago than there are in Texas. Think about that. Okay, that's 750,000 plus new registered voters in the last two years alone in the state of Georgia. And the Democrats came close two years ago. Even in an election that was embroiled in controversy, Stacey Abrams got 48%. Okay. Of those 750,000 new registered voters, if 300,000 of them vote um, for Joe Biden, he will win this state. Okay, in other words, of those 750,000, if, you know, let's say a few hundred thousand of them don't even vote, okay, and another 100,000 or so vote for Donald Trump. If, if Joe Biden carries a, a – there's a little bit of wiggle room there, but if he wins just about 300,000 new voters, he will win the state of Georgia. And that is a very conservative estimate because, you know, if you register to vote, generally you're going to vote. Okay, and if you take the time to get registered, you're going to vote. Okay, and Georgia doesn't make it easy for you to, to register to vote. And that is why, for the first time on this channel, I am characterizing Georgia as a tilt for the Democratic Party. Now, in the state of South Carolina – Lindsey Graham and Jamie Harrison are locked in a suddenly pretty competitive race. We'll see what ultimately transpires there. But on the presidential level, it, I'm going to label it safe, not as a margin characterization, but a likelihood, just as I will in Tennessee, even though the margin might end up being the same there. Now, in North Carolina, the Democrats were scared to death when they learned of Cal Cunningham's sexting controversy. Um, so far, it has, the Cal Cunningham, that being the Senate candidate for the Democrats there, as he's trying to oust Tom Tillis, um, the incumbent GOP senator. So far, that does not appear to be hurting his candidacy very much. Um, and it's also, you know, it has had no effect really on Roy Cooper, who's a very popular incumbent Democratic governor who's up for re-election and will um, in all likelihood defeat his challenger, uh, Dan Forrest. There are also two House races right on the border with South Carolina, um, right where my mouse is, um, that are pretty competitive and actually, as, as of now, expect to flip from red to blue. Um, so polling has been very, very interesting to watch in the state because the, Demo the, the statewide Democrats are performing pretty well. Both Cal Cunningham and Roy Cooper, as I said, have done um, very well here, whereas Joe Biden has actually been underperforming them a little bit. So let's go through the most recent polling. Um, Biden plus six, plus eight, plus six. Uh, plus six. Those are recurring polls there with uh, Serpent Monkey. So once you get out of that, though, Emerson, tie, then plus five, plus six, plus eight, plus one. Um, it's pretty clear this is a close race, but Joe Biden has the edge at the moment, okay? And 
I think what you're going to see ultimately is I, I think what, what what what's ultimately happening is you're sort of having some longtime independents who are very clear that they want to vote for Cal Cunningham and, and Roy Cooper just because they have, they're a little more proven, whereas it's a little they're a little unsure just yet if they're even going to participate on the presidential level. And remember, again, Joe Biden and Barack Obama did win North Carolina in 2008, but only by 14,000 votes. But right now, the polling has been consistent. There's no suppression going on there, by and large, as a result of the Democratic governor being there. Um, which is not a partisan statement. We just know, again, these are the, these are not my words. These are the words of the politicians themselves. There's another 15 for Biden. Um, Kentucky's eight votes and West Virginia's five uh, will go to Donald Trump handily. Um, let's stay going east here. Virginia, on the other hand, will remain safe for the Democratic Party. This has become a liberal bastion for them. Um, they have the state legislature in their control now, both senators and Ralph Northam, the governor as well. So they're sitting pretty in that state. Illinois, also another state that the Democrats should not be concerned about at all. Indiana uh, used to be a state that the Democrats could be very competitive in. Another state Barack Obama and Joe Biden carried in 2008, but over the last 12 years, it has steadily shifted further and further to the right, and Mike Pence's presence certainly puts that over the top for them, or helps do so. So that's going to be safe. Okay, Ohio, very interesting state to break down now. Um, in the state of Ohio, you have these sort of Rust Belt voters, oftentimes are sort of pro-life Democrats. You get a lot of that in this state. It's a largely Catholic state. It's a tough state for Democrats to win in because even their own voters, um, pro-life moderate Democrats, get stolen all the time by Republican candidates. Now, they did re-elect Sherrod Brown to the Senate in 2018. That was a good result for them. But that same night, they weren't able to win the governorship when Mike DeWine won. Um, and of course, this was a state kind of like Iowa that almost just lost, that basically just shit its entire swing state label altogether, given the margins that we saw uh, unfold in the state of Ohio altogether. But by and large, this will remain, I think, a very close state. Um, Sherrod Brown's reelection, I don't think, was too telling just because he's a very popular senator. He's an establishment guy. Voters like him. But let's go through the recent polling. Trump plus two, plus four, plus two, plus four. So there you go. I mean, it's close, but I think Biden, I think um, Donald Trump still is able to fend this one off, unlike in Georgia. OK, now in Wisconsin um, or you know, what, let's do let's take care of Maryland real quick here. Um, this is a safe Democratic state. We don't really even need to talk about that. Whereas in Wisconsin, um, two statewide races in the 2018 midterms were very friendly to the Democratic Party when Tony Evers was able to unseat a big establishment figure for the GOP, that being Governor Scott Walker, and when Tammy Baldwin easily won re-election. But before that, there was a state Senate special election down here in the southern portion of the state um, early on, I believe, in the first year of Trump's term where a Democrat won that state Senate special election. And um, as, a, as a result, he is now representing that district for the first time. A Democrat is representing that district for the first time since, I believe, the 70s. Um, so that was sort of the first sign. Then we had the midterms. And then there was also a Supreme Court race up here in the state of Wisconsin, um, where the Democratic figure, even though they're officially nonpartisan, the one who clearly aligns with the Democrats, won in a, in a pretty convincing upset, despite the fact that 180 polling sites in Milwaukee were reduced down to five. Um, so that's pretty telling. Also, this is a state where polling has been very kind to Joe Biden. I'm going to label this likely and it's 10 votes. So there's Joe Biden already reaching Hillary Clinton's 232 number with plenty of votes still out there. In Michigan, another state that was very um, friendly to the Democrats in the 2018 midterms when they also flipped the governorship when Bill Shute was defeated by um, Gretchen Whitmer, uh, who's obviously been in the news a lot lately. Um, um, furthermore, uh, in the state, uh, what we saw was uh, John James was the one who uh, challenged Debbie Stabenow um, in that re-election bid, and Debbie Stabenow was able to fend him off. Now, um, John James is giving this another crack, this time against Gary Peters, but so far Peters is hanging on. And as we know, polling has been very consistent for the Democrats here. The Trump campaign has pulled their ads out of the state altogether. It is not looking good for Donald Trump in this state, and those 16 votes, I think, go to, Donald, to Joe Biden. Pennsylvania, I think, is a little bit different um, because I think Trump's support in this state is a little underappreciated. OK, I think people have written off this state a little bit just because sometimes it can be seen as sort of the furthest leaning left of these three Midwestern states, even though Michigan was the closest. Um, of course, all three of these uh, went to Donald Trump at less than one percent. 
um, in 2016. So that's the margin of error that he's working with. Another state that had two statewide races in the midterms that Democrats swept. Bob Casey Jr. easily won re-election. Tom Wolf easily won re-election. All these House districts in between Pittsburgh and, and uh, Philadelphia, um, they're all safe Republican seats, but all of them, um, when they were, when the re-election, um, when the re-elections happened in, in the midterms, all of the margins were closer. And so if the margins are closer there and in suburban Philly and an Erie up here in the Northwest, um, then the Democrat is going to win. So I'm only going to label this tilt because polling has been a little tight. Um, and also I think it's a little different compared to Michigan and Wisconsin, but that's a good indicator of where this area of the country is leaning. Delaware, of course, the state that Joe Biden represented in the Senate for ages, and D.C., the most liberal area in the United States, will go blue, and there puts Joe Biden over 270. Now, in New Jersey, Republicans have been able to get a few things done from time to time in that state, but it's not worth discussing. Um, Connecticut, another seven votes go to Joe Biden, as will four in Rhode Island and 11 in Massachusetts. Now, in New York, of course, this used to be Donald Trump's home state. It's just not, you know... It's not anything to really consider all in all, and I expect Joe Biden to easily handle that, as he will in the three in Vermont. Now, in, in New Hampshire, this was the closest state in the 2016 election. Um, Hillary Clinton barely survived and won this state. And then, oddly enough, Maggie Hassan, a Democrat who was able to unseat a Republican incumbent senator, one of two Senate pickups that night for the Democrats, the other being in Illinois, um, when Tammy Duckworth defeated Mark Kirk. Um, she won by an even closer margin. She won by one-tenth of one percent, and she's a very vulnerable Democratic incumbent um, in two years, so keep an eye on that. But on this, in this election, that will go safe. Now, Maine, um, we can fully expect the, the, uh, the at-large and the first congressional district to go Joe Biden's way, whereas I think this, the rural district, even though Jared Golden, the House member from that area, is uh, cruising on his way to re-election, that will be fine. There's still no response from the team here at 270 uh, to tell us what in the world is going on with the district here. But if conveniently enough, in Nebraska, I do not expect the one in Lincoln and the Omaha area to flip anyway. So there's your map. Um, that's not a landslide, but it's not close either. 349 to 189. That's a much bigger margin than what Donald Trump won by when he won with 306. But as you can see, Joe Biden flips the states of Arizona, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. That's significant. While coming up just short in Texas, Iowa, and Ohio, and also hanging on in Nevada. Um, and that pretty much tells the story at this point. So we're going to obviously come back with our next Senate election prediction video. A lot of important developments to break down there. So thank you guys so much again for watching this video as you always do. Please hit the subscribe button if you have not already. Hit the like button. Comment down in the suggestions below if you have any questions, comments, anything you need to correct me on. I'll be sure to address them in my next video. So thank you guys so much again for watching, and I'll see you in November.